If you fly over Cape Cod, it is easy to be impressed by the number and diversity of Cape Cod's many freshwater ponds. Looking down, the ponds cover more of the land area than you may have expected. Some general facts about Cape Cod ponds. There are about 994, they cover 11,000 acres, and 165 of them are great ponds. These are ponds that are over 10 acres and are considered public waters. What are public waters? Chapter 91 of Massachusetts state law is a public trust doctrine which says the Commonwealth holds all great ponds in trust for the benefit of the public. In section 45, it goes on to say that great ponds shall be public for the purpose of hunting or boating and are open to all inhabitants of the Commonwealth for fishing purposes. Most ponds in the Cape are called kettle ponds. I was always confused by the word kettle because they don't look like tea kettles to me. But if you think of a kettle cooking pot, the name makes more sense. Many of you have heard about how the glaciers formed Cape Cod's ponds 12,000 years ago. Kettle holes are considered deposits of glaciers versus a form of erosion. It was the collapsing land and deposits around the ice cubes left behind by the glacier that form the depressions in the ground that we call kettle holes. So what is the difference between a pond and a lake? Scientists who study ponds, limnologists, define a pond as a quiet body of water so shallow that rooted plants grow completely across it. Ponds have water temperatures that are fairly uniform and change with air temperature. They also have little wave action. Lakes are larger than ponds. They're too deep for plants to grow except on the shore, and they may stratify in the warm summer months, having temperature layering throughout the water column. It is easy to see why there is some confusion about what to call different fresh water bodies on the Cape. From a geologist's point of view, most of them are kettle ponds because there are few with natural rivers or streams feeding them. Using the limnologist's definition, we might call more of them lakes. Regardless, most of their names are based on local history. We often see ponds just from the surface and a place for our own interactions with them, but ponds are ecosystems, which are incredible complex interactions of physical, chemical, and biological components. There are many examples of physical features that impact a pond, its shape and depth, or the amount of wind it receives. Heat and energy from the sun affect different chemical reactions and allow for different biological forms. On this slide is a chart which shows different temperatures which are favorable for different fish. There are events at ponds that go forward unseen by many of us, like the freezing over of a pond in winter, or maybe a year when the water is open all winter. These changes that we do not notice can have dramatic effects on life and chemistry in the pond. A freshwater pond is typically rich and diverse with plant and animal life. The changes over the years are important to observe and understand. Macroinvertebrates can be a helpful tool to understanding if your pond is healthy. If you find creatures that are sensitive to pollutants, this indicates good water quality. It's really exciting to look at a pond at its many different levels of habitats, from the surface to the mid layers and at the bottom in the sediment. There are so many incredible creatures and this is a great activity with children. We have had great fun at the Brewster Pond Coalition during our school field trips, exploring a scoop of pond water. We are always amazed at what we find. In ponds, there are complex food webs and relationships between creatures. If these links are disturbed, imbalances and unhealthy conditions can develop. 
There is no place on Cape Cod that human beings haven't impacted the environment, but this is especially true for ponds. The good news is there's a lot we can do to help our ponds recover. Bring toxic chemicals to hazardous material collection days. Maintain your septic system. Pump your septic tank every three to five years. Plant buffer strips using native plants and trees. Reduce your use of toxic chemicals. And support local efforts to protect and buy open space. A great way to help ponds is to limit your use of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, and fertilizers. Even if you don't live right next to a pond, these substances can survive in our groundwater and end up in ponds eventually. Another way to help improve water quality is to reduce impervious or hard surfaces and lawns near and around ponds. This in turn reduces the amount of polluted rainwater entering the pond. Many of the ponds in the Cape have reached the tipping point and are showing signs of trouble in unbalanced ecosystems. We see reduced clarity, fish kills or mussel die-offs, invasive species dominating, the absence of pollutant-sensitive macroinvertebrates, and cyanobacteria blooms. Cyanobacteria, which used to be called blue-green algae or harmful algal blooms, have increased on the Cape in the last 10 years partly due to the warmer waters and the increase of nutrients in our ponds. Cyanobacteria are problematic because they release invisible toxins as the bloom cells decay. Toxins can also be released in your body or a dog when the stomach acids break open the cells. The best way to avoid exposure to the toxins is to stay away from visible blooms and pay attention to signage warning of toxic cyanobacteria. And when in doubt, it's best to keep out, as the CDC says. So as I close, I think it's important to remember, whether pond or lake, healthy or struggling, each one is like a different friend, each with its own unique history, unique personality, and unique beauty. We are always learning more about ponds and their ecosystem and the importance of our actions, each individual. So many thanks for doing your part, and thank you for listening.